name is Malcolm, and I'm the chief advisor for Technicorum Group, and uh, we are we do everything in there is in the digital asset space. And uh, for me, the metaverse journey started six years ago, uh, and I was an advisor to several projects from 2017 to 2018. Uh, at that time, it was not called the metaverse, right? It was called the virtual reality. And if you go back uh, maybe 15, 20 years, then there are all the multiplayer, uh, massively multiplayer online uh, games like RTS, uh, real-time strategy, or role-playing games, World of Warcraft, you know, these kinds of things, or like Second Life. So these were the actual origin of uh, VR environments and metaverse. Right. But of course, after Facebook came out and rebranded themselves as Meta, then they came out with the, the term Metaverse, though nowadays we all call it Metaverse. Right. So Metaverse would be all the other types of uh, realities like uh, uh, VR, AR, XR, MR, etc. Right. So we're here to chat about uh, what's the potential of Metaverse um, and it's going to be free form. And uh, so Elvin and, and I, uh, El Elvin and our group has already done a joint venture uh, where we have a metaverse company and uh, we are doing various things in it. So we were here to let you know what we see as the potential. Uh, because the, of course I'm sure a lot of you have heard uh, metaverse was super popular like one year ago and then now it seems to be a gone narrative because uh, Facebook itself is pulling out from metaverse as well. Right? Uh, but I see a great potential that still exists in this space and we're here to tell you about it. All right, cool. Um, so I think one of the questions people have like uh, asked me about in this field is what is exactly the metaverse and what can it do for me? So I think depending on where you're coming from, if you're a consumer or, or a business, um, I've, I've seen quite a bit of investments into Decentraland and uh, Sandbox. Um, they've been buying lands and all that. Um, even banking institutes are going in to experiment. However, they're it seems like they're not getting a bit of the returns because um, the users are not uh, fully, um, you know, returning back all the time. So concurrent usership um, is um, uh, one of the main challenges. And so I think um, for me, the metaverse needs to evolve a little bit more. Um, in some areas, more like gamification um, and not just uh, playing games and all that, but a little bit deeper that involves some challenges um, and also I think if we could connect the real world and the digital world uh, there will be some interesting use cases example like um, getting offers uh, discounts etc and all that working with advertising and sponsorships that will result in direct benefits in the real world possibly there are some interesting use cases and uh, yeah so I think uh, metaverse uh, itself um, needs to also take into account the um, the onboarding of new people coming in. Some some of it you need to understand about the wallet, the the connection, and all that. Let's try to find a way to do away with that and onboard the next uh, generation of mainstream users. Right. So maybe I can tell you about you know the original metaverse applications or the projects that I was involved in. So the very first one that I got involved in was a uh, environment where they created a user toolkit and anyone who knew how to do basic HTML5 uh, coding could use their toolkits and create their own metaverse. Meaning that you can create an environment uh, where you can link uh, different content and it, and even Ethereum Foundation, right? We'll talk about Ethereum just now. Uh, Ethereum Foundation actually created uh, had one space as well and they had uh, uh, LV and they had um, Ford, and even Ford, you can see a car, you can rotate, you can move around in it. Right? So that's, that was 2017. And today, those are even stronger applications that have been developed out. Uh, another project that I got involved in was a game. Right? So it's a metaverse game, a VR game. So I put on helmet, headset, equipment, took a gun, went around sh shooting zombies. Right? So there are cameras inside the room. Uh, then there was another project that was a listed company from, uh, from uh, Germany and it's still around today, it's still on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and uh, what they created was a, uh, a celebrity-led kind of a VR environment. So the founder of that uh, company was actually a very big football agent. So he got Bayern Munich stars like Cristiano Ronaldo from Real Madrid the Real Madrid team to come in as well and they put their avatars 
and they even had like uh, sports stars like a uh, famous uh, uh, German table tennis player and they could capture his image and that was also playable so they had the sets and you can play the games with your favorite star right so that's another application and uh, this founder also had uh, adult entertainment applications of uh, virtual reality so that's another of the, the lines or industries that uh, metaverses VR can be used for right so those are just some of the early examples what we are doing today, uh, five years, six years from when I first got into the space, uh, like Alvin said, uh, and in fact he was mentioning earlier, so he's the CEO of a company that does digital twins for environment. Now environment is only one of the aspects of Metaverse, uh, and their aspect is to create hyper-realistic digital twins. For example, they've already done a uh, proof of concept for Singapore Land Authority, and in fact a lot of governments, a lot of authorities, a lot of government agencies uh, large enterprises, developments, building owners, all want these, right? Because then they can put it onto a platform and people who are not even in that space can consume content. They can navigate, they can see how it is and they can build further applications on it. Uh, and, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a robotics company and they are doing mobility uh, robotics. And what they do is just capture the space and, and scan everything so it's hyper-realistic. So it's very useful for developers, con contractors, uh, quantity surveyors to measure the progress of a building uh, and also for the development owners and the building owners to uh, actually create this, these metaverse spaces to allow their customers or visitors to interact with these. Uh, maybe Alvin can also give uh, further insights on this. Well, uh, thanks for talking about my project. So, um, yeah, um, so, so, so for me, when I started out the company uh, looking into Metaverse, um, I, I see that there's a lot of common uh, uh, problems in terms of uh, trying to get user traction, uh, getting a consumers on board, and, and everyone's like trying to sell land and all that. So I was looking more like what else besides the consumers that we can bring value to and, and so I started <clears throat> on, on the path of um, looking into uh, using the metaverse, especially the digital twin metaverse, uh, to, to help um, governments and uh, enterprises solve problems. So, so I think going forward, one of our strategies would be to also adopt AI. So, so one of the idea is to use uh, computer vision to help uh, create 3D models of the real world faster, and of course, um, train the avatars to on the client's um, knowledge base, so that um, these avatars can be 24 hours, could be multi-language, and it's definitely a, a lot um, uh, better to engage uh, with the end users. So, so yeah, so so that's mainly the uh, area that we're focusing on, and eventually we'll want to democratize. Um, uh, the metaverse development so that you can have a platform to easily create um, environments and <clears throat> and avatars using generative AI. Yeah. Right. So let me cover some more applications, right? Because we are all about applications. If you create a technology and nobody uses it, then it's no use. And uh, it brings to mind an interesting article about, uh, I think, Decentraland or Sandbox, where there was a, a uh, an article saying that there was only uh, less than a hundred people inside interacting at one point in time, uh, at any point in time. So that's very, very small adoption, right? Um, and that doesn't uh, bode well for the industry, which is why actually a lot of the large uh, players have uh, started to scale back a bit from this. But anyway, there are a lot of applications. Like for example, uh, I remember that early last year, there was a uh, article from KPMG that they spent $30 million to build their metaverse. And when I look at the metaverse, I, I, I hope nobody from KPMG here, but <laughs> it's, uh, it was terrible, right? It was something that's 15, 20 years ago kind of technology, cartoon stick figures, and they expect their customers and clients to actually use it, their own staff to use it. So I think, I think that was a, a lot of wasted money. But why I'm mentioning it is because uh, another large, um, a very, very huge uh, uh, major financial institution actually started talking to us and said that they wanted a hyper-realistic, very high definition kind of a metaverse so that their customers can do uh, their financial services engagement with this. 
And uh, now we are also talking to banks, and uh, a lot of uh, the larger banks recognize that they are losing touch with the younger generations. So they are viewed as very traditional, stodgy, conservative, you know, boring. And then the, the new generation, millennials, don't want to bank with them. Uh, so what do they do? They come up with uh, digital avatars, they come up with metaverses, come up with environments where they can create banking halls. Like for example, uh, HSBC, you know, PwC, you know, they have spent millions of dollars buying plots of land in metaverses in order to engage the younger community. So it's not a matter of just making money from it, uh, but it's a, it's a window to capture, recapture that kind of environment. And in fact, uh, earlier Elvin was mentioning about AI. So this is something we are getting into uh, for a separate project. Uh, we are injecting uh, AI into different verticals, but uh, it's also very applicable for the metaverse because with a metaverse environment and uh, digital avatars uh, coming on board uh, infused with AI, then a lot more things can be done. Right? Uh, so eventually, I think we are all moving towards uh, what the movie Ready Player uh, Go is actually envisaged and uh, we are moving there. And um, I remember I was consulting a bit for Sony as well, and they were asking, you know, what are the various applications? And I said, people like uh, Apple, Facebook, Sony, if they concentrate on what they are good at, which is deploying large amounts of capital for R&D, they can own the hardware uh, area, right? Because the software, the applications are so fast moving, it's very hard to compete with everybody. But if they just concentrate on the things that are very high barrier of entry, own the hardware, which has to keep improving, right? Then eventually it will improve to the stage where we are able to get into the metaverses without so much hassle. Right now, the entry, the barrier entry is very high. It's very hard for people to get in. Like for myself, I bought an Oculus, like, I think one and, one and a half years ago and I hardly ever touched it, right? Because there are so few applications in there that you can actually use uh, at this point. And of course, you get dizzy if you spend too much time uh, on the headsets. Yeah, on that note, <clears throat> I think Apple will be launching their VR um, glass very soon. So um, we are also kind of preparing um, our own library of 3D assets to, um, to start developing on, on that platform. Uh, and um, I think some of the other use cases, um, besides, you know, I've been talking about enterprise use case. Um, so for personal use case in terms of metaverse, um, the metaverse could be a private metaverse. It doesn't have to be like a public one where um, you, you and your family members can be inside. And the avatars that are inside, you can actually train them uh, with your social media, with you know, even your speech, sound and all that. And technically, um, it's getting a bit black mirror, um, meaning that uh, you could immortalize yourself in the metaverse. So long as the metaverse is there, if you train your avatar to be like 60, 70 percent sounding like you and thinking like you, um, that's another whole realm of area that you can. Um, it's definitely um, within possibility as well. So, um, so, so yeah. So, so one of the areas like the griefing market, um, you could metaverse your pets. Um, you could um, uh, send videos and photos, and then the AI could replicate its animations and its sounds and all that and yeah so um, so, it, so there, there is definitely an ethical kind of question and, and so that's how brand new technologies like AI metaverse when they combine together it will definitely bring out a lot of ethical questions whether we should do it or not it's like the movie Pet Cemetery. so yeah so that's a lot of interesting use cases Right. Um, other things like fashion labels, uh, for example, like uh, Louis Vuitton or uh, Dolce Gabbana, you know, they were getting into this space of NFTs and creating their metaverses as well, so that their customers can interact on another level. Um, I, earlier I mentioned, you know, governments are getting into it. A lot of tourism boards are getting into metaverses as well, so that they can create a digital twin of their city. Uh, like for example, Seoul, Singapore, uh, Dubai, these are three cities amongst others that are already developing a digital twin uh, of their city, right? So that the tourists can come in, can navigate, can find things, right? So eventually we'll see a lot of different contexts. And uh, one of the, the metaverse projects that we're involved in, uh, we've been working on it for the last one and a half years. Uh, it is a reimagination of how people interact. So we know that uh, you know, everyone has different levels of comfort with technology. Right? Some people just want to see their phone and do, let's say, WhatsApp, WeChat, uh, communications. So that's a very uh, web 2 kind of an interaction. 
So in the Web2 space, a lot of people are already very comfortable with the internet and tools and apps. So we have to move these comfortable millions and billions of people onto the metaverse where there are only like what, uh, 10, 20 million worldwide who are actually using it. So there are hybrid models. Earlier you saw some slides uh, from the doctor uh, who was mentioning. So you have the Web 2.0, you have Web 2.5, which is a hybrid model, which I think is what's going to be useful right now. And then eventually there'll be a decentralized, open peer-to-peer -peer kind of a uh, Web 3.0 network. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually also from the Asia, uh, Asia Web3 Association and uh, we believe that more and more technologies are getting in the Web3 space and uh, metaverses are one of those very big uh, environments over the last one and a half years that have been uh, exploring Web3 interactions. Right, so this project that we're working on, uh, it is a combination between uh, Web2 and Web3 and a hybrid model. So how we onboard people who don't know crypto, well, who don't have a wallet, don't know how to get their, uh, their fiat monies into, into crypto, <coughs> we use middle layer platform providers. And so what we can do is to create just email and user accounts. And you don't even need to have your own wallet. You don't need to have your own MetaMask or your Ledger and, and your centralized exchange wallets. Uh, you can create something that's linked to your username, to your email. And this allows us to bridge the gap between the Web2 and the Web3 users. Uh, so another very simple example of how, how you imagine this is uh, the internet, right? Like almost everyone here or practically, uh, probably everyone here uses the internet, right? You use a mobile, you go on the desktops and you get on the internet. But I would say less than 1% of the people would actually understand how the internet works. Right? If I ask any of you how does the internet work, I don't think I will get an answer here. Maybe in a telecoms uh, conference they will know, but probably not here. Right? But you're using it. So eventually, 10, 20 years later, everyone will be using blockchain applications. A lot of metaverses will be, be used, but you don't really know how. You don't even need to know how because that's something that the middleware, the middle layer platform providers are making it's so dumbed down and easy that we can just use it, right? So I, I, I remember uh, back when I first started in this space, 2017, 2018, we went to Korea. And at that time, Bitum was the biggest exchange uh, up before our bit took over. And how Bitum actually reached out to the, the normal people is very simple. They just had one big red button, press and you can get into crypto, right? So all you need to do is that, right? Make it so easy for people to get in that they don't even need to know all the th the, the background layers. So this is what, uh, you know, builders like Alvin are creating. Creating the environments, creating the platforms, the tools to make it easy, seamless for the, the people to get into the space. Yeah, I think um, our time is up, but I just want to leave with uh, this thought. So if you, if you imagine you have books, you have magazines, and then now you have videos, you have YouTube, you have social media. These are all mediums to communicate. And next, what you're going to have is experience, and which is what the metaverse is going to bring next. So um, it's not a trend, it's coming. Thank you.